I had a rule. If you steal and get away with it, don't go back. I broke that rule for that day. I don't know why. I didn't need to go back. For some reason, I went back. We're passing these big bars of chocolate. At least let's get something. At least it's not gonna be a wasted journey. So I, I take these big bars of chocolate, put them inside my coat, and, and we leave. Um, and then I hear these uh, running footsteps behind me. I just assumed it was someone running to catch a taxi or something like that. Anyway, I get this, this hand on my shoulder. Could you come back into the store with me, please? So uh, as we're going into the into the store, my father and his, and, uh, his wife came out of a, sh a bedding shop and they saw me. So I was serving beer and alcohol to all the people in the pub and then I watched the place transform. It was like a nightmare. Everybody just changing. Women becoming banshees, old men becoming paranoid, guys becoming aggressive. Just watching it is like, the hell is this? Um, and I had this car accident. But I, I skidded to the hole, rain pounding on my car, and I was just like, I sat there just thinking to myself, we could have died then, could have died right now. And I would have died a non-believer. I would have died a non-Muslim. And all those things that I'm holding onto, all these things that are stopping me being a Muslim, they're gonna be gone anyway. And everything's temporary. That was the moment I just said, I just gotta do this. Assalamu alaikum, brother Hamza. We are really happy to have you with us. I want to start with, who is Hamza Mayat? Can you tell us briefly about your life? Wa alaikum salam. Yeah, um, basically I'm born and bred in England, grew up in South Wales. I used to be a financial advisor. I accepted Islam in October 2001, which was three weeks after 9-11, um, from which I, I would say I did my hijra to London, um, where I began my journey in Islam. Um, I'm, today I'm a uh, da'i, mashallah, a frequent speaker's corner. I've got my own uh, YouTube channel for uh, Hamza's Den, um, and also I got my own scarf business. How did you first hear about Islam in your life? My mum had a dream that uh, I was in trouble. Um, my mum and my mother and father had split when I was young. She was living in Manchester and I'm living in South Wales. She makes the move, she comes to South Wales to look for us, uh, me and my brother, to see if we're in trouble. And she doesn't know where I live. She doesn't know anything about me. She just knows the town I live, which is called Cumbran. She arrives in this town, Cumbran, and she meets this lad. Um, first guy she sees, young guy. She's I'm just gonna ask people, do they know me? Right, as if like I'm some famous guy everybody knows in the town. If she seen this guy and she just said to him, excuse me, can I ask you, do you know Darren and Wayne Myatt? And he's like, I just, I just left them. She's like, what? He goes, really? She goes, yeah, yeah, I've just been with them. So imagine she's arrived in this town and the first person she asked has just left me five minutes ago. SubhanAllah. This lad has just come from me because we, we were in a computer shop and we always get the lunch for the guys that own the shop. So we get to play the latest games. I'm a bit of a gamer. So basically um, she sent him to us. So me and my brother are inquisitive, what's my mum doing here in Wales? We, you know, we haven't seen her for years and years. So we arrived, she asked, are we in trouble? And we're like, no. She said, well, I've had this dream that you're in, it seems like you're in trouble. And, and I can't, and we was talking in McDonald's and um, this is the McDonald's. And, uh, but you're not in trouble. And I'm like, nah, nah, I'm not in trouble. So basically she goes, okay, she give me her number, her phone number, which I put in my pocket. And then two weeks later, I did get in some trouble. Basically I used to be a bit of a bad boy, a bit of a thief. Um, and basically I was going to a uh, Sainsbury's and I was stealing. I had a rule, if you steal and get away with it, don't go back to the same store straight away. Why? Because they may have their suspicions the first time, but they're not quite sure. But if you go back in, their suspicions will be confirmed. Oh, he's back. Now we're going to watch him. Now the cameras are going to de de they're going to be on him. Okay. I broke that rule for that day. I don't know why. I came out. I got what I wanted. Pot of gel so I could do my hair and a brush. Yeah. I didn't need to go back. I didn't need the money. I didn't need anything. But for some reason, I went back. It felt like we was being watched. So we was moving from aisle to aisle. And to be honest with you, we were gonna leave. We was just gonna leave the store. I was like, oh, let's just get some of this just, just because. Just because, no reason. We're passing these big bars of chocolate. At least let's get something. At least it's not gonna be a wasted journey. So I, I take these big bars of chocolate, put them inside my coat and, and we leave. Um, and then I hear these uh, running footsteps behind me. I just assumed it was someone running to catch a taxi or something like that. Anyway, I get this, this hand on my shoulder. Could you come back into the store with me, please? And my immediate reaction was, oh my God, she knows, she knows. Okay, I, I, have to, I just, what can I say, what can I say? Oh, I bought these from somewhere else. And she was like, but what? So all of a sudden I'm in trouble now. I think, oh, flipping it. So she's taking me back to the store. Now I, I could have just broke away and run. She was a small woman. I didn't, I don't know. I just felt it was a fair cop. So I'm going back in and we're passing this bin. And I think if I go back in and I've got nothing, no chocolate on me. Yeah, I say, what? 
Well, you, thought you made a mistake, yeah? So, so I slipped my hand inside my coat and we're passing this bin and I dropped the chocolate in the bin. And it's like, bah! The bin had just been emptied. So she stopped, she turned around, she goes, that was very clever, wasn't it? Get it out, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she knew what I was trying to do. She, and now, now I've exposed what I'm doing. She goes, get it out. So, so I'm getting I'm bedding in this bin, getting out of these bars of chocolate. So now, it's, now she's caught me with the goods. I'm done. I've caught, I'm caught. So uh, as we're going into the, into the store, uh, unbeknown to me at this moment in time, two doors down from the Sainsbury's entrance, my father and his, and, uh, his wife came out of a, sh a bedding shop and they saw me just at the same time. Whoa. Just at this moment in time, they were there. So they see me going, this older woman holding me, taking me in. They could work out why would Darren be with this older woman? Yeah, because I'm 15. I'm 15 at this time. So they're following and uh, they see me going to be taken into the office. So then they knew, ah, oh, okay. So I'm in this office and they, they, they said his parents are outside. And I'm like, oh, no way. And then that's when my, my father came in and like I said, he punched me. And I was so embarrassed and so ashamed. And I brought shame on my family and all this kind of thing. And I was like, what am I gonna do? Anyway, I had this phone number in my pocket now that I never had before, mm -hmm. yeah, that I'd received two weeks mm -hmm. earlier. So I just pulled it out, phoned my mum, said, look, I'm in trouble. And she said, no problem, just come. Just jump on a train, don't worry about your clothes or anything. Just jump on a train, come to me, I'll pick you up. We'll look after you, don't worry. And when I returned to Manchester, my mum then took me to clothes shopping. She took me to this one particular shop. It could have been any shop, any shop she could have took me to to buy clothes, but she took me to this one particular shop. Whilst we're buying the clothes, she's saying to the guy who owns the shop, can you give him a job? He's a really, really good salesman. Uh, you know, give him a chance and this, that, the other. So he goes, we don't employ guys, we don't employ girls. So they have this thing, they have girls, pretty girls working. So the guys come to buy the clothes because they want to be served by these pretty girls. But he gave me a chance. And alhamdulillah, and he was a Muslim. And he was the first Muslim I'd ever met, yeah, that, that I'd integrated, you know, closely. Seen what Islam was, see, met his family, seen how beautiful the culture of this cohesion, you know, this cohesive family thing didn't exist from where I was. You know, you know I grew up in a white council estate. Yeah. We don't see this. You know, just one thing, just eating together. Just the other thing, the, the, the parents are, are incorporated into the family. They're not distanced from the family. And it, it was that. And the way they welcomed me into their family, as if I was part of their family. Do you know what I mean? And the food and, and it, it, it's just the whole ambience of it. It was, it was something that I'd not experienced. For that in it alone, stopped me stealing. Just that encounter with, with him and that, I just said to myself, you know what, I ain't gonna steal anymore. Yeah, because I'd, I'd been influenced by this thing that I didn't realize what it was. So basically he became my friend. Yeah. and I worked for him. I used to work with him on a weekend and I got a job in, a, in this factory. Funny thing about this factory, it was called Remploy. It was for, it was a factory for disabled people. Uh, and I was the uh, token, you know, politically correct, able-bodied person. <laughs> so, 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 so everyone else around me is having epileptic fits and all sorts of things going on. And me, I'm the able-bodied guy. So I work in there. Um, he says to me, come and work for me full-time. We want you full-time. Don't employ girls anymore. We want you. Yeah. And he came, he took me for a curry, sat me down, said, look, I want to give you this. I'm going to give you more than what you're getting now. I want you to come work for me. So that's how we, we, we grew together. Again, he wasn't practicing Islam. I wasn't getting any dawah, if you like. Yeah. Nothing, nothing like that. Just, yeah. just being his friend. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. We realize that 80% of our audience, including this video, are not subscribed to our channel. As you know, we are a non-profit organization and advertisements are disabled on our videos. Towards Eternity is not just a YouTube channel, but also a medicine. Here we try to educate ourselves and the youth Islamically. So the only reason we are asking for this is to spread the truth. It may seem like a small act, but inshallah, it will help us reach millions of people. Now, let's click the like and the subscribe buttons and let's together walk towards eternity. I wasn't getting any dawah, if you like, yeah. nothing, nothing like that. Just, yeah. just being his friend. And then uh, they closed their shops. They moved to, we, then we started doing the markets in Wigan, which is the north of England, where he met his wife and I met my girlfriend. And then we parted ways. He went to London, where his brother had a solicitor's practice and such, and he, he went down there to be his accountant. So he's in London now. He's getting dawah in London. Or should I say, he's getting nasiha in London. He's learning his religion, right? And um, I used to visit. He, he tried to talk to me about his, he tried to pass on what he's learning. And then I, I, I would say to him, okay, I'm listening, listening, listening. But then when it came kind of a little bit heavy, I said, look, are you praying five times a day, mate? Because I knew that was a fundamental of Islam. Yeah, I knew if you're not, you know, that's, that's it. Five times prayer, if you're not doing that, everything else, it doesn't really matter. And I don't know how I knew that, but I knew that. So I would, I would use this on him. I say, are you praying five times a day? And he would look down at the floor very sheepishly and say, well, no, 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 not five times a day. I said, well, look, when you're praying five times a day, 
then come talk to me, yeah? When you're praying and I can see you really believe your religion, because I've grew up with you, mate. I've seen you don't believe it. When you believe it, then I'll listen. At least I'll give you the courtesy of listening. But like I said, I used to visit him and he's, every time I used to visit him, his friends used to come around and they were talking about um, things in Islam that are prohibited and, you know, talking about alcohol and all these kind of things. You know, they're my five poisons that I do, the drugs, alcohol, yeah. So he, he sp was speaking about alcohol and um, that I listened to because I've, I've always been argumentative. So I'm like listening. And, I'm, and, I, and, I, and I was listening and I'm like, yeah, you're right, mate. The, you know, alcohol is a poison. Why am I drinking it? And, and I stopped. I stopped drinking alcohol. I mean, so, so much so, right? And it, this is one um, experience I had that showed me how right I was in doing so. So basically, I was working in a pub, yeah? The public had a bar, if you like, on Christmas Eve. So this is the night before Christmas, yeah? And I was not drinking. So I was serving beer and alcohol to all the people in the pub, but I, me, myself, not drinking. And I was watching people coming in. Hey, how you doing? All right, but everyone's, uh, everyone's happy, smiley, whatever. And then I watched the place transform. It was like a nightmare. Everybody just changing. Women becoming banshees. Old men becoming paranoid. Guys becoming aggressive. Just watching it is like, the hell is this? Yeah? Anyway, so I stopped drinking alcohol. Um, so that was one effect. Islam had on me, indirectly. Again, because it wasn't because I was a Muslim. So that was happening. And I went back to South Wales, wh back where I grew up. I lived in there with my girlfriend and I had two daughters. They were three, four years of age um, when things went different. Mm -hmm. So basically um, I'd set up this uh, finance company. Mm -hmm. So we were like a broker. So we would basically, if, you, if you've got a problem, your house get repossessed, you can't get a loan because your credit rating is bad or you can't prove to how much your income is, my company could solve that problem. I was very, very good at what I did. I could basically, someone getting their house repossessed, I could stop the repossession and then I could remortgage their property. I could get them more money in their pocket extra and cheaper than what they were already paying. So I was really, really good at what I did. Everything went swimmingly. And then, unbeknownst to me, I don't know how this happened, but I ended up talking to these American businessmen. And these American businessmen had 100 million in, in car finance to lend to the UK. So they wanted to set this car finance and they wanted to use my company as the master broker to permeate it through the UK, yeah? So we're like, okay, sounds like good, sounds good. So um, I said to my father, look, got this opportunity. I reckon it's gonna make us millionaires, yeah? And, um, I'm gonna to go to London. I've uh, made an appointment with them on September 13th, 2001. I'll, st I'll stay down in London for a week. I used to, live, used to go to the bookies down there and that because I was a bit of a gambler as well. I'll smash the meeting and the meeting was booked at the Grosvenor Hotel uh, opposite the US Embassy on September the 13th. So I said, I'll go down, I'll smash the meeting because I was so confident in what I do. And that'll be it. So my dad's so happy. And I arrive in London and um, I'm meeting my friends. And then on September the 11th, I'm sat in his office, uh, his solicitor's practice, his brother's solicitor's practice. And we heard what's happened. We heard about the planes going into the Twin Towers. And when we realized how serious what had happened was, um, the businessmen canceled the meeting, which was due to take place two days later. They went back. The meeting was rescheduled for the following week. Now, dur during that week, I got dawa from non-Muslims. <laughs> yes, I, I go back to South Wales, so which is like a proper white council area. Okay, uh, and I'm in the pub. Yeah, I'm not drinking. I'm just in the pub, and uh, people are uh, saying, "Oh, Muslims are this, Islam is that," and, and I'm sat there listening, thinking, "No, they're not." And they go, "What do you mean?" I say, "Well, I've got Muslim friends, and I've not experienced what you're saying. I don't, I don't get the feel that they hate anyone in that way. I've only ever seen good things from them." And they go, "Yeah, well, well, you." Muslim. I said, you know, I'm not a Muslim, mate. Go, well, why aren't you then? I don't know, why aren't I? <laughs> why aren't I a Muslim? If, if I believe it's true, because I'd been reading a book by Yusuf Qaradawi, uh, the, the Halal and Haram, the lawful and prohibited in Islam. And this was a moment in time when I realized how practical Islam was. It wasn't some abstract religion like Christianity or anything else or Buddhism or you know, these ideas, these, these things are going to happen later. It was basically this is gonna help you now, do you get me? This is gonna benefit you and your family now. And, and when I asked my friend, what is this? And he said, oh, this is Islam. This is, you know, if you read this book, book Yusuf Qaradawi, Qaradawi, it's Quran, it's Hadith and such. Yeah. So anyway, so I was still on my thing though. I said, uh, so I said to him, are you praying five times a day now? He was like, yeah, yeah, we all are. So even his girlfriend, or his, his wife who he'd married, even she was praying and wearing hijab and all of this stuff, which really blew me, blew me away. That was a massive impact on me. I was like, you're praying now? So I, I had a duty of care to listen. You know, I, I promised I said to him I'd listen. So I listened and um, I recognized Islam as the truth. I truly believe we have three fitra. It's in the mind, it's in the, you know, it's through the intellect, it's in the heart. 
yeah, and it's in their nafs. And um, if you're going to accept Islam completely, all three have to agree. You have to be, you have to be intellectually convinced Islam is true. You don't have to be. You could just love Muslims and you want to belong and be part of something. No problem at all. But you need to bring the head along as well as to why it's true. Otherwise, people are going to question you. And if you meet a bad Muslim, then you might think, oh, Islam is bad now. Do you get me? So I was intellectually convinced Islam was true. But now what? What do you do with it? So the meeting was scheduled for the week. So this was the first week. The second week, um, I went back to London and um, I met the American businessman. And I was just sat in this hotel. These two guys were just waffling on at me. I was sat there just thinking, if I become a Muslim, this is pointless. I'm not going to be able to do this business. I'm not going to be able to do this finance. Yes, car finance. Yes. So I'm thinking, I can't do this. I can't do my other business anymore. Forget adding this, this business. So I kind of blew the deal. Kind of blew the deal. I just like, yeah, yeah, whatever, mate. Yeah, so I go back to South Wales. My father is like, what happened? I said, oh, forget it. He goes, why? I goes, I think I'm going to be Muslim. Yeah. And, um, but my heart was like, it's not, it's still not ready. And I was holding on to things. This was, this was the main thing. If I became a Muslim, I'm not just going to be one of these flaky ones. If I become a Muslim, I'm going to live Islam. I'm going to do Islam. And it's going to cost me everything. It literally is going to cost me everything. My missus, she would never uh, accept me as a Muslim. Even though she heard the same dawah as me, she, she, uh, she would never accept uh, being married to me as a Muslim and the children being brought up as Muslim, the girls being brought up. She would never accept that. So I knew that's potentially going to go. Uh, I can't do my finance business anymore. That's gonna go. If that goes, my father's gonna go because he's my business partner. I'm gonna break his heart and, and his dreams. That's gonna go. I used to enjoy this gambling habit. That's gonna go. I didn't wanna give this stuff up. So basically, uh, I was resisting. I was resisting Islam. Not intellectually, you couldn't, you couldn't come to me and, and give me anything extra to say, look, sit down, sit down. This is why Islam is true. I'd be like, yeah, I know Islam is true. I get it, it is true, I believe it's true. But I just ain't ready to accept it. Because I'm not ready to give up the things I'm ho- I have right now. I'm not, I'm not ready because if I do, I'm going to lose everything. Because I was living with my girlfriend. I would lose my place where I live. My father and the business, um, I would have to give those things up too. So I'd have no income. Um, and this is when my friend, when I, I told him my concerns, because he said, why are you accepting Islam? You believe Islam is true. Yeah, you know everything's temporary. Uh, why are you not accepting Islam? I have no income. I'll be living in a place where there's no Muslims. I'll have no friends, I'll have no income, I'll have no, no nothing. I said, how, how can I, I can't put myself on the street. And he said, no, if that's what's stopping you, don't worry, we got you. Come, you come and stay with me, no problem. You can come to London, I'll give you a room in my house, you just stay there, no problem. No need to pay any rent, just come and stay there. And his brother said, I'll give you a job if you, if you need an income. Don't worry about not having income, I'll give you a job. You can come and work for me in his solicitor's practice as the office manager. So anyway, so they alleviated, alleviated my problems. Um, and I had this car accident. And fortunately, alhamdulillah, it wasn't nothing serious, but I, I skidded to the hole, rain pounding on my car. And I was just like, I sat there just thinking to myself, could have died then, could have died right now. And I would have died a non-believer. I would have died a non-Muslim. And all those things that I'm holding on to, all these things that are stopping me being a Muslim, they're going to be gone anyway. And everything's temporary. So then that, that, was, that was the moment, that was the epiphany. That was the moment I just said, I just got to do this. So my heart was ready. And I went to my girlfriend and I told her what was happening. And she was like, well, I don't want to be with you. Yeah, I don't, know. I don't want to be with you if you're Muslim. I'm not bringing my girls up as Muslims. She got my daughters and she moved back to Wigan. That was that. So I'm like, okay. And I'm speaking to my father and, you know, telling him I can't do this business anymore. My father didn't want to know me. I, t- I think it took 15 years for him to speak to me again. That, w- that was that. And I came to London and uh, that was my hijra. So how did you feel when this happened about your girlfriend, about your father? Um, to be honest with, him, with my girlfriend, um, it, I was more heartbroken about my daughters because I cried my eyes out like I've never cried in my life saying goodbye to them because I knew it was, it, I'm not going to see them. But I knew that I was beginning this new life and it was going to be values that the, her mother would ne- their mother would never accept. I'd be moving to London, which is like three hours from South Wales. And um, I'm starting from scratch. I'm, I'm starting my life again. So this wasn't something I did easily. Hence me holding on, even though me believing Islam is true, I'm still holding on to not accepting Islam because I want to keep these things. Mm. It was devastating. And even when I said to my father, I, I could see his heart breaking as I was telling him. And he said, can't you do it for six more weeks? I said, dad, I can't do 
do it for another second. I said, I'm done. I said, look, everything we've prepared so far, the money's going through the banks, all the deals I've done, they'll cover all the debts of the business or anything like that. You're not going to be left in debt. Um, but me, I can't do it. So he was like, get out. So I left, I got in my car and I drove to London. So yeah, it was, um, to be honest with, him, with my girlfriend, no, I didn't feel lonely. I don't do loneliness. I'm comfortable in my own skin. So can I ask in a general way, how, how does Allah replace these, these people? It was a good test for Islam. Because I'm told in Islam, Allah says that whatever you give up for my sake, I'll replace it with things that are better. And so, and I, and I watched that. I watched where I used to go to the pub, which was the communal place to meet people and such, it became the masjid. People who in the past were friends with you, now it, they were brothers to you. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was a complete thing. I used to play pub Sunday football, Friday night football. Yeah, yeah. I used to have a girlfriend. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I ended up in Morocco getting married, Alhamdulillah. So my girlfriend became a wife. Um, I got two daughters again, mashallah. So everything that I had to give up was replaced with things that are better. Everything was taken care of. Even my business, even my business from that to what it is now, another level. Because like I said, if, if I was still did that business, I would have gone down the pan in 2008 when the massive crash came, when all the subprime lenders were all taken out. I would have been caught in that. Do you get me? Yeah. So, um, alhamdulillah. Yeah. So uh, what about salah? What about you know, fasting? How did you... Okay, so salah, uh, I learned to pray in one day. Alhamdulillah, I, I, I learned uh, Surah Fatiha. Um, I, I would like break it down to Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. No, I, I smashed Fatiha in a day, should I say. Um, and then I, I went after the four calls and then, so that, that was that. Fasting was a real surreal experience. So again, coming from where I'm from, right? So imagine, right, I used to uh, go to the pub and on a Sunday I used to play football. And the whole routine was you go play football, come back to the pub, tray of sandwiches come out and all the boys there eat the sandwiches and watch the football. That's that's basically how it works. And the alpha male, the main guy, will get the, the lion's share of the stuff and then, then his cronies and then yeah, you'll see what's left kind of thing. Okay. So anyway, so in fasting, because Ramadan came about a month after me accepting Islam, I'm sat in the masjid and all, you know, the things out and all the, the dates and the samosas and everything's here. And, I, and I'm sat there with this mentality. Better be quick. I better be quick here because everyone around me here is hungry. Everyone around me hasn't eaten all day just like me. So everyone's gonna scramble. As soon as it's time to break, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm eyeing up chicken wings there, pizza there, then I'm gonna have to be quick. And then the most surreal thing, again, ever happened to me with one of these moments was when the adhan went and rather than what I expected to see, which was, yeah, what I saw was people doing this. And I'm thinking, what the hell is this world? <laughs> Do you get me? I'm thinking, what's going on here, man? Rather than feeding themselves, they were feeding others. And that, that, that blew my mind. It's just something as simple as that was just like, wow. Because I'm coming from a place where it was, bah, where here it was like. So yeah, that was my first experience of fasting. So how did, how did your career as a Dai start? How did you decide to become a Dai? I used to do markets and I, I used to just speak to people um, about Islam because I used to wear like kameez and stuff. I, I, I was like proper kameez. Mm. <laughs> so um, I used to love it. I used to talk about Islam all the time. People used to question it and I used to kind of find the answers and things like that. Um, and then what happened was I realized that um, I could teach this, I think, some of the things I've been learning. So I went to my Amir at my local masjid and I said, look, do you mind if I like have a room like on a Monday night and just teach people how to deal with Christians and atheists and such, you know? And uh, he said, yeah, no problem. So it's like three people used to turn up. And um, I, I went to my email and I said, look, no one's coming. I said, I'm trying. I'm talking to like three people. No one's coming. He goes, don't worry. Allah sent his people. Don't worry. You relax. Just do it. Just do your stuff. You do your thing and Allah will do his thing. Yeah, you just focus, be sincere in what you're doing, and Allah will send his people. And then, mashallah, these brothers did come. Brother Dr. Imran, Brother Abbas, uh, 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 Sheikh Shanawaz, and, and about three, four others came. Brother Nazambo. And so now I had an audience of people who were kind of into dawah. So now I'm, I'm, now I'm thinking, I've got to step my game up a little bit. So I was like, I was like kind of bored, and I was like, all right, so you have atheists, you have soft atheists, hard atheists. I, 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 was, into, I was into this thing. And, and then what happened was, some other Muslims came to us and said, look, we need your help. 
And we're like, why is it? Because there's these Christians, they're like Pakistani Christians and mixture and such, yeah. And they've got this Christian center. And every Monday they have a debate with a Muslim and they, they put curry and rice for free. So they bait the Muslims in and then they confuse the Muslims. And we need people to come and, and refute them. So there's Sheikh Shanawaz who, who used to come to my talks, was really knowledgeable in such. So he used to go and debate and we used to go as backup support and the Q&A afterwards and things like that. And we did this for a while. And then that's when we created um, EF Dawa from this, came from there. And then that's when we decided to start going to Speaker's Corner. What is the most emotional moment that you had in Speaker's Corner? Uh, I got really angry and I nearly headbutted someone. So basically I was, I was destroying this Christian lady. He was simping for her and, and he was trying to coach her. And everything, everything he said, I was just, I said, stop listening to this guy. <laughs> but then he leaned over and shouted in my ear. And that's when I, I just wanted to get rid of him then. So uh, that's one of the most, if you say emotional, because I don't do, I don't do emotion realistically. You know, I have a saying, I nicked it off Bruce Lee, but I changed it a little bit. All right, this is my motto. And I urge all Muslims to adopt this in your life. Do not, I repeat, do not react emotionally to the things that people say to you, for then they know they can control you with their words. Yeah, because as soon as somebody knows you're going to behave a certain way because they say a certain thing, they're controlling you. Never give the power of anyone. So I've been to Speaker's Corner and I've heard the most foulest things said to me. Yeah, the only reason I flipped on this guy because he shouted in my ear and I took that as physical assault because he was right in my face. I'm not having that. Yeah, most people when, you come, when they come to see this corner are regurgitating something they've heard. Now, you know the, uh, you know the hadith about the Bedouin Arab urinating in the masjid? So when the Prophet ﷺ was praying and the Sahaba were there and a Bedouin Arab came into the masjid and he started to urinate yeah, yeah. and the Sahaba wanted to grab this guy and start, and the Prophet ﷺ, what did he do? How did he react? Held them back, let him finish. Let him finish urinating. He knows no better, right? So if you have this in mind in Speaker's Corner, you know the person coming to you really doesn't know. They might think Islam is this thing. They might have this caricature of what they envisage Islam to be based on propaganda they've heard or whatever it may be. And they're angry at this thing. They're not angry at Islam because they don't know what Islam is. So they can come with the most foulest thing, just ask them, why do you believe that? My favorite response is, why do you believe that? Who told you that? And they're shocked, well, uh, well doesn't it say, oh, no, 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 I'm not gonna make your argument for you. I want you to tell me why you're saying it and why it's wrong or whatever. And they collapse under that scrutiny because they want you to react to what they're saying. And they want to react to that, what you, they react to your reaction. But when you don't react to what they're saying and you smack them straight on the nose, say, well, why are you saying that? What, what, what do you mean by that? They're, they're lost because they weren't expecting that. They wanted this emotional reaction because Muslims all get angry when you insult their prophet. So I or insult Allah, insult the Quran. Well, you're supposed to be angry at me. Why aren't you? Do you get me? So it was that type of thing. So uh, alhamdulillah. But I, so I don't really do emotion in that sense. So how do you see the future of Islam in, in the UK? Do you think it's going to be the you know, major religion yeah. in the future? Yeah, 100%. People are embracing it daily. People are encountering Muslims now more daily. And they're not necessarily encountering cultural Islam now. They're encountering Islam. Even cultural Muslims are becoming proper Muslims, realizing there's a difference between the cultural baggage that gets attached to Islam and Islam. Um, and this is the age of social media. This is the age of information. And that's the beautiful thing about Islam. You can find all the information now. Like I said, many shahadas are people that don't even have Muslims around them. Literally, they're, 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 you know, their only connection to Islam is the online presence, online community. Recently, every time I do a live stream now, it's a shahada. It's like on Saturday, I did a shahada. Um, two months ago, this, this uh, Argentinian girl, she messaged me. I got back to her the other day. Last Saturday, I gave her shahada. A Polish guy messaged me in the midweek. Got back to him. I give him his shahada on, I think, Sunday. Every time we do a live stream, mashallah, we do shahadas. So it's becoming more palatable now. And it's amazing, these people who are becoming Muslim are not in Muslim environments. They're not got Muslim friends. Most of them say, we've just been watching, we've seen YouTube, We've watched your videos and you make so much sense. And, and it's just amazing, subhanAllah. And the, the towns are growing. We, we're having kids. We're encouraging marriage and all of these things. Well, society's going the other way. They're encouraging this transgenderism and yeah. non-binary and all these kind of things. They're not encouraging family. Yeah. It's, going the, it's going the opposite. So what's going to happen is they're going to get bred out. That's the reality. You can't keep going that way. If you're not having children, then who's having the children? The Muslims are having the children. So who's going to take the places? You know, London will become Muslim majority, Birmingham, Manchester, all these places will become Muslim majority. Yeah, inshallah.
So lastly, if you had a chance to speak to all the non-Muslims in the world, what would you like to say to them in just one minute? Okay, so if I speak to non-Muslims in all the world, first of all, know what you're being invited to. When someone speaks about Islam, understand what they're saying. Ask yourself, the belief you're holding today, why do you believe it? Is it true? Why do you believe it's true? Do you, because clearly geographical location can't be a source of truth if no two religions can both be true. So just because you're born somewhere doesn't make it true. So question your own personal beliefs as to why they're true. Question, is there a God? This is your first start. Does God exist or not? If God doesn't exist, then don't worry about religion but then you need to understand why do people claim God does exist? Because people say to me, what's your evidence? What's your proof for God? I ask people, what's your proof for gravity? Yeah, I said, can you see gravity? Can you touch it? Can you taste it? Can you smell it? No. What can you do? You can judge and measure its effects. Yeah, so that tells you what? You believe something exists based upon its effects. But I'm saying the same thing to you. Believe God exists based upon the effects of God, which is creation. Mm -hmm.